You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Hey, hey, welcome back to the show. This is episode 15, and today's guest is truly an inspiration to me. If you've ever heard the phrase bias for action, she is the epitome of that. When she thinks of an idea, she doesn't just sit on it. No, she acts on it. She's founded two successful businesses in her lifetime with no business degree and only education from the School of Hard Knocks. I'm talking about Vivian K, the founder and CEO of Kinky Curly Yaki, a wildly successful natural hair extensions brand. Known by fans as the Queen of Kink, Vivian founded Kinky Curly Yaki in 2012 to provide natural hair solutions for women who wanted the ease and flexibility of kinky curly hair extensions. On this episode, you'll learn how she got the idea and started her business from her living room and is now at the head of a soon-to-be million-dollar brand. Let's get into it. Welcome to the show, Vivian. Tell us more about your background and what you're currently working on. Um, well, background, uh, you know, I'm from Ghana, so uh, that's where I was born. Uh, I immigrated to Canada when I was about three years old. Uh, so I live in the greater Toronto area, up here in the D-Dot, you know, with Drake and the, and the Six and all the woes and all that. So <laughs> um, that's where... Um, that's where I reside and that's where I run my business out of. Um, and right now we've got, um, you know, some new and exciting things going on for Kiki Curly Aki. We just launched uh, Wigs. I saw that. Um, exciting. So we, you know, been, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's so exciting because I, I personally, I've been wearing wigs from, from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Um, it's for me, especially as a mom, it's just an easier way to, you know, it's a low maintenance thing for me to do. Um, so that's what I certainly jumped on and everyone was like, oh, you know, we need wigs, we need wigs, but, uh, you know, it's such a, um, you know, wigs are such a personal product. Um, So I wanted to make sure, you know, what we were producing uh, was was right for, you know, for our queens. So, um, you know, we've got two lines of wigs. We've got like the Casey White Girl wigs, which is what's uh, currently being produced right now. And then I've got my own line of wigs, like the Queen of Cake collection, um, which um, which I've basically curated and, and uh, have uh, you know custom made with our manufacturers to make sure that these wigs are basically ready to go, uh, ready to go wigs. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited about that. So you mentioned that you're originally from Ghana. How did that upbringing influence your entrepreneurial fire? Oh well, you know, in Ghana or even you know. Africa and the Caribbean, basically the jobs aren't as abundant as they are here in the Western world. So um, if you want to have a job, you have to have a business. So you have to hustle. Uh, so my mom, you know, she worked in the markets of Kola uh, in, 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 in Accra and carried me on her back while she was selling things. I guess I breathed in all that, that entrepreneurship while I was a baby. And then when she brought me over here uh, to Canada, um, you know, she, she always tried to start some sort of hustle, whether it be, you know, braiding hair or selling hair, or selling Avon or something. So I've always seen that entrepreneurship, um, you know, while I was growing up. And of course, I, at the time, obviously, I didn't realize it, but that was, that really spoke to me. And so then when it came time, I realized that I already had all the, the tools and the the fire you need yes. in, order to, in order to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so interesting because, you know, I'm Jamaican and, and I agree in that we take for granted that we see entrepreneurship all the time. It's just, we don't think of it. We don't think of the, you know, person on the side of the street, saw the newspaper as an entrepreneur, but that that's a business owner. That's a hustler. That's somebody who's like, all right, I'm gonna go out and create my own opportunity. Exactly. Those are their original hustles. Exactly. Right? Like, uh, yeah. And, spe- yeah. <laughs> and speaking of original hustlers, So a lot of people think to get started in business, you need a college degree, an MBA, or all of these professional certifications. And we think we have to check all these boxes before we do it. But you actually did not finish college. How did you push through that noise and go after building your business? Well, you know, I've always marched uh, to my own drum. Uh, So there was was no real noise. I, you know, I was drumming so loudly. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I, I was making my own noise. So I, I never felt 
um, you know, the pressure to complete school or to, I needed an MBA to do this and do that. Of course, you know, I had my days where I was like, oh, I wish I had a degree so I could do this. But, um, you know, even in my, my former corporate life, everyone was just saw something in me and saw all that drive and saw that uh, the vibrancy um, and said, you know what, she'll, she'll make it happen. And so that's, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, get your education. Like even I would encourage my, my son to go get a degree. Like I, you have to, it'd be nice to have both sides of the story, I right. guess you could say. Right. Um, but um, do I feel it's necessary? No, but I think, you know, I would probably have a better advantage if I had both. But okay. despite that, I, you know, I've still been able, like, you know, I, this is my second successful business that I've started from nothing. Uh, so, you know, it's not only motivation, it's not only education, really what it is, it's the drive and it's the dedication that you need in order to um, to build successful businesses. Absolutely. And, and yeah, this podcast is, is, you know, it's not trying, we're not trying to say that anyone should not get their degree because, you know, I have my college degree, I also have my MBA and what I see a lot is people who are overqualified and scared to go after it. So I just wanted to bring out the fact that, hey, exactly. it's not a prerequisite. Like it's all about the drive and it's all about you just finally taking that risk and doing something. Um, and speaking of risk, what was your first business and, and how did the idea for that come about? Uh, well, my first business, I was a, I was a wedding decorator. Um, my older sister, um, like I said, there's four of us. So my older sister got married and she was the first one to get married. Um, and so then, uh, you know, she had hired a decorator who said, you know, for example, we'll do everything for a thousand dollars. And then when, when the time came, she was like, oh, we need another thousand dollars. So, of course, that was you know, that wasn't fair. And we didn't have that kind of money at the time. Um, and this was, was back in 2005. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know what, I, we don't need much. We're not, you know, overly extravagant people. So, you know, I can make this simple. Um, and I thought if I felt this way, that other people would feel this way. Uh, so I started Vivian's Decor and Designs uh, back in 2005. You know, I love that business. It wasn't until 2000. 10 that I decided, oh, not decided, but um, <laughs> that I, I, I went at it full time. <laughs> okay. Okay. And so you were juggling for five years. How did you do that? And when did you know it was time to leave? I knew it was time to leave when I got laid off. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to laugh at that. <laughs> yeah, I got laid off. And um, I was funny because my boss at the time was like, you're a strong girl. I think, I think you and your business will do great. And that was part of his reasoning for laying me off because uh, he felt like I was being better on my own or something like wow. he was giving me my freedom I guess um so I was like okay cool I took it and ran with it yeah do you think that they were they informed about your business and you think did that influence them at all like hey she's more focused on her business <laughs> like I believe that's that's basically what happened okay yeah. you know you know you start your side hustle somewhere usually you start your side hustle from work so <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> well advising that you know you do that um, this age. I mean, back then it wasn't as, you know, computer and technologies weren't as, you know, as, um, as, as prevalent, I guess you could say, but, yeah. uh, you know, you gotta start somewhere. Okay. From home. <laughs> so were you, were you financially prepared? Did you have money saved or were you just kind of like, you just hit into overdrive at that point? I just, uh, I had no money saved. Like I had, you know, some funds saved. You know, luckily I had received a bonus and with that bonus, I bought my first Mac desktop and with that, I built a website. So, so um, you know, I always like to say it doesn't do things for fun. You know, things, the, the series of events that happened after that was just, it, everything just fell into place um, and without me really trying. And I think it's because, you know, I, my steps are, you know, your steps are ordered. Yes. Um, and as long as you just follow your gut, then everything works everything should work out as long as you follow that 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 voice in your head and that gut feeling that tells you you know what to do and what to say absolutely so you were a wedding decorator how did you transition out of that and then make the decision to create kinky curly yaki were you a hair person no it was not a hair person i actually created kinky curly yaki out of a need i had while doing or so, um, you know, because, uh, you know, Toronto is one of the most diverse um, cities in the world. Uh, so we were doing Indian weddings, Italian weddings, uh, you know, Caribbean weddings, anyone that had a wedding, we were doing it. And in order to do that, uh, I felt I needed to look presentable to everyone. And, you know, you know, being in, coming from a corporate environment, you know what that 
presentable means. Mm-hmm. And so it means I can't walk in with my poor Z hairband to knot it. I mean, I could now, um, but at the time it wasn't really being natural wasn't really a thing. Right. Um, so I needed hair that looked like me, that looked like it would grow. It had grown out of my head and it made me feel authentic and true to myself. Um, you know, I was tired of the whole African in the front and Indian in the back. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, so I, I had, I, you know, I got a, I got, I got a weave, I had a weave and I had, it was kinky straight. And I remember going to like a black girl meetup group and then them saying, Oh my gosh, girl, like, what's your regimen? I love your hair. How do you do that? And I was be like this is a weave <laughs> like yeah and I'm like yeah this is totally a weave well girl you should sell that mm-hmm. and I was like I should sell that yeah right I, like this the idea all went off and so then uh, you know I started it in the down season of my wedding business which is you know the winter months of so November December um, and it just quickly took off uh, now, how I transitioned out of it was uh, by complete pure accident, which would have, which is my son. So, you know, two years into, you know, running Vivian Sikora and Curly Aki, I discovered I was pregnant. And because, um, you know, I'm a hands-on business owner. So um, with the decor, I was doing a lot of the setups and, and doing that type of thing. Uh, you know, it, it was just a really physical, a phys- it's a physical business. I'd like to make sure that, you know, the drapery was hanging from the ceiling correctly and all that. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, I needed, I wanted to be there for my son. So I wanted to focus on a business that I already had that allowed me to stay home and work at two o'clock in the morning in my pajamas mm-hmm. and, you know, ship at four o'clock in the morning and then run to the post office and drop stuff off. Uh, so that, so that's basically how I transitioned that business. It was, um, it was bittersweet um, because, you know, that was like my firstborn. Um, but uh, it was something that I had to do because I was seeing that kinky curly yaki was really, really, really taking off. And I, and I needed to put my focus, you know, all on, um, on creating and, and promoting okay. uh, the brand. What were some of the first steps you took to start taking kinky curly yaki from idea to brand? For example, you know, getting the inventory, learning about shipments and all that. Uh, well, it was a lot. It was, you know, being an entrepreneur is being, you know, you have to, you're basically in the school of hard knocks. So I learned a lot of expensive and valuable lessons. Um, you know, first when I was trying this, like when it first, when it was just trying my hair for myself, I had tried different vendors, um, you know, uh, many different vendors, many different textures. Um, and I would order, you know, I, I would order it once and then order it again under a different name to see if I would get the same product, I get the same, um, quality of product uh, until I kept finding that, you know, there was particular vendors that would send me the same quality product each and every time. And if I asked for a tweak, they were very, um, you know, they were very uh, able to do that. So, um, you know, it was a very, um, it was a very expensive learning experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's something that, you know, anyone starting this type of business should go through because you need to see the ins and outs and need to know how uh, your product is going to act when it does this and when it acts when it does that um, so that you have intimate knowledge of what your product is as opposed to just blindly selling whatever just because it's the latest thing to do. That's that's not the case because um, in order to build your business, you have to create, you have to be able to answer your customers' questions in depth. Yeah. And And if they ask this, they ask A, then you need to be able to say X, Y, and Z and sometimes Y, you know? So, um, yeah. And how did you even know where to begin? I mean, you have, you had no background in hair at that time. Like, did you go to the beauty supply stores and ask them where they're getting their hair from? I mean, how did you even know where to find vendors? I searched the internet. I searched and searched and searched. And especially at that time, which was back in 2010, um, you know, I had to, search the drags of the internet and read on on hair forums and facebook groups and ask questions and all the information wasn't readily available so i had to do i had to do some real research um so that's basically how um i was able to find them okay got it got it and so yeah this was we're talking about 2010 2011 before there were a lot of hair companies that specifically cater to natural kinky hair and now it's 2016 and the market is way more competitive so how do you yeah. clearly distinguish yourself in this now oversaturated market uh well you know being an old ge i guess helps as well and you know if you look back we've got a track record so we're not just some you know instagram company that just popped up out of nowhere um but what i'm finding is that now uh, i have to 
to put a more personal spin on it. Um, so, you know, showing more of me and showing the person behind Kiki Kurliaki is certainly helping to uh, solidify, uh, you know, our, our top, uh, our presence in this, in this particular market. Um, some people, you know, go to market with wigs, but they don't necessarily try out everything. So, you know, everyone knows that I try out every single texture that I have. I, you know, you see me rocking wigs that I've been wearing for four years. So I understand the quality of hair. And I think, uh, you know, women appreciate that. They appreciate that whoever's selling the textures actually wears it and they actually understand it. Um, and I think that's where um, Kinky Curly Aki really, um, surpasses other brands in the market and also because we have such a variety of texture we've always had a variety of texture um and also because we're just we're, i'm you know i'm not going to sit here and pretend that we're some glamorous this and that at, you know no we're really down to earth and you know i'd like the brand to reflect me and so we're really down to earth so a lot of people really feel that um you know that they're really supporting their their girlfriend, um, and when you make your your business personal, um, people gravitate towards that. They see that you have that passion and you put in that work and you put in that dedication in order to present the best that you can. And you know, especially in this day where you know again the market's now being saturated, people appreciate that. They appreciate that there's a face behind the brand, that there's a real person, that's a real human behind everything. So um, I think that's where um, that's where we stand out. That's how we that's how we stand out. I'm so glad you mentioned that about the personal aspect of the brand and how important that is, especially now with Instagram and all these, you know, Snapchat, all these different platforms that are allowing you to get closer and closer to your customer and your audience. Because something I heard the other day was, you know, people don't subscribe to your podcast. They subscribe to you. And I'm sure it's the same way yes. with any brand. They're buying it because they believe I personally, you know, believe in your story. I can I can relate to that immigrant background and, you know, that hustle spirit. So that's what caused me to reach out to you personally. So I'm so glad you brought that up. And then that leads me to the question of marketing. So what were some of the first steps you took to even start marketing and building awareness of the kinky curly brand, kinky curly yaki brand when you first started out? Well, when I first started out, um, you know, this was back when forums and Facebook groups were more um, popular, I guess you could say. This was before Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter. Um, so, you know, I saw there was a girl that um, that had already been rocking kinky hair extensions. And I said, hey, girl, um, I'm thinking about doing this. Do you mind just I, I didn't intentionally like because at the time, you know, influencer wasn't a thing. Yeah. It was just, hey, girl, hey, <laughs> hey, girl, hey. <laughs> You know, I needed another person's opinion on this hair. Do you mind? Oh, sure. And you know what? It just sort of blew up from there. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't, like, you know, and that's how I started out. And then plus, because I had uh, a presence in, in Facebook hair groups, like, you know, I was, because I, at the time I hadn't started, like I hadn't really solidified Kinky Curly Aki. It was just sort of something percolating in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. But I'd already had a personality and a presence in these Facebook groups. So then um, when, of course, they found out, and it's funny because when I first started Kiki Curly Aki, no one knew it was me. I didn't let it be known because I, I just didn't think that anyone needed to know that. Like, yeah. It was just, okay, here's some, here's some hair. You know what I mean? Um, but then when people found out that it was that girl that's always funny in the Facebook groups, oh, my goodness, of course I'll support her. And then, you know, it just sort of grew up from there. Like even just this past um, just this past July when we were in New Orleans for Essence Fest, um, you know, my very first customer came and bought some more hair. And she came and met me in real in real life. And, you know, we it was just it was such a sweet moment because it was like she was the first person to oh, be wow. like, I like you and I like this hair. I, and, and she still supports like it's and this is, you know, five years later, she's still four or five years later. She's still supporting me. That's amazing. Um, and that's a testament you know, to a really it's, good it's brand. A blessing. Yeah. 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 So you and, mentioned there were no, you know, influence weren't a thing. Influencers weren't a thing at the time. You were just reaching out to people in your hair groups. But did you intentionally, as you know, you gain more and more popularity, reach out to YouTube stars? Because I see a lot of them giving reviews on your hair and your clip-ins. Did you do that or did they reach out to you? When I first started, I, I, it wasn't intentional. When I first started, um, I reached out to a few bigger names. 
Um, and, you know, a few of them followed through and a few of them didn't. So then I was sort of off, off of my influencer, <laughs> you know, let's send some influencers some hair. But then, um, then there were some that came to me, like, you know, came to me and said, um, you know, I'm just starting out. I love, you know, I would love to work with you. Da, da, da. And I look for authenticity and for try. Like I look for what, you know, I look for myself in other people. Um, and when I see that, I, 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 I'm 100% behind you. So, um, you know, there was a, a few influencers that I started with, you know, two years ago that had, you know, nobody they had like you know, 3000 followers or whatever it was at the time, but they showed themselves true. And so then anything that they've done or anything that uh, that they put together for me, I was impressed because I'm not a micromanager. I like to just hear. I want I want everything to come from you organically. And so then uh, some of the bigger names that are, I mean, the name, people that weren't anybody's two years ago are, you know, huge influencers now, such as Hey Curly and, and Nay Too Curly. Um, you know, those are girls that, um, you know, they, we grew up together and I saw something in them that I felt was, that would benefit my, that would benefit my brand and also make me feel good about working with them. So if, my advice to anyone that's that's working with influencers is don't you can't base everything off of numbers you can't base everything off of you know oh, how many likes they get you have to work with people who are authentic to your brand and 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 are organic in the way they uh, in the way they work so when you started out there were actually a lot of naysayers i've heard you say this that there were naysayers yes. who were like is there even a demand for kinky curly hair how did you, you know, push through that and figure out that there is a demand for this and then start to sell to that demand? Yeah, well, I remember, you know, the naysayers were like, who, why would I want to buy hair that grows out of my head? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I, I could just grow it myself, um, you know, or, or, you know, kinky hair was just not something like that was just. Like, why would I want kinky hair extensions? I would rather have that silky Brazilian or that, you know, beautiful Peruvian or whatever exotic texture du jour. Um, so I thought if I like it, then somebody else has got to like it. <laughs> I can't be the only person that wants to look natural. I don't want to wear 32 inches of Brazilian down to my butt and then kill my natural hair trying to blend with it. So I figured that other people... If I, I mean, I, I can't be the only one. <laughs> right, so, right, 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 right. Really How are you continuing to grow the brand now that it's out there? There's so much competition. Um, what do you do to to up the ante with all this competition? Um. Well, it's just again, just being true to myself. Um, because you know, I, I, you know, I what I'm what they call a lazy natural. I can't <laughs> be bothered. <laughs> I can't be bothered with the twist outs and Same. the and the this. Absolutely, I can't do it. Be yeah. Yeah. And so if if I feel this way, then I'm pretty sure there's tons of other women who feel that way. So I just wanted to let everyone know, like to let people know, it's okay to be a lazy natural. You can protect, like I. I don't wear twist outs. My hair, like I've got what I call 4Z hair. I call it straight out of the, the, the villages of, of Ghana type mm -hmm. hair. So mm -hmm. I don't get that 3C curl pattern. I don't get that, you know, 4A curl pattern. I don't have, I just have nice cottony hair. Mm -hmm. So um, in order for me to, you know, you know, to to be able to rock different styles, I have to rock wigs or I have to rock, rock clip-ins or I have to rock um, uh, uh, weaves. So, you know, I want, everyone, I want everyone to feel comfortable in their own beauty. If mm -hmm. you need to accentuate that, then so be it. Who cares? Everyone does it. Right. Um, why... Why, why is it against the law to wear my own texture? Like, why is that not, like, why is that, you know, why does that sound crazy? It's not, not. Um, so, yeah. Do you think the lazy natural is your competitive edge? And, and is that how you're continuing to kind of position yourself? <laughs> I don't, I, I like to sort of say it every once in a while, but I don't, well, I mean, no one, would, no one wants to be really called lazy. Right. So I really call, no, I'm just a protective style warrior, yes. you know? So, yes. um, you know, because I'm a mom, uh, you know, a single mom at that, and I'm running a business, I don't have time to cry over my failed twist out. I just have to keep, put on a wig, keep moving, mm -hmm. right? So, um, 
I just want everyone to feel, you know, feel good about themselves and feel beautiful with not only the texture that comes out of their hair, but their protective style and that looks authentic and, and real to them. Great. So everyone's feeling beautiful. Everyone's feeling great. How and when did you start to reap the benefit of that and profit and reward from your business? Um, I would say in... Um, what is today? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what today. You know, when I had my baby, I made it a point to tell people, listen, I'm not Amazon. I'm not Walmart. I'm I'm going to take some time off. I'm going to have my baby. Mm-hmm. And when I come back, oh, I'm going to, you know, it's on and popping. Yeah. And so then I think when people saw that I was a real woman and a real person and at that a new mother, it sort of showed, a, you know, a human side to business. And, and from then, you know, obviously, you know, having a son, you have to hustle extra hard. Yeah. So, and people respect the hustle, right? So, um, so I would say, start, you know, when I came back in 2014 and just said, you know, I'm back. I'm here, like, you know, because during that time that I, you know, sort of, um, you know, for about six months, I sort of took it easy and, you know, wasn't, you know, driving it as hard because I didn't want to make promises that I couldn't fulfill. So, um, you know, I took some time off. And then when I came back, there were all these other companies that had popped up trying to fill my trying to fill my space. And so then I came back and I came back hard. So, um, you know, starting in 2014, it just, uh, you know, I, I outgrew the one uh, e-commerce platform that I had started out on, which was Big Cartel. And I moved up into uh, Shopify. And then I, I would say maybe six months into being on the Shopify platform, I, I was moved up into the Shopify Plus platform. Um, and even, in, um, you know, just a few week- weekends ago, they invited me to their head office to speak about being an entrepreneur and, um, you know, how, um, you know, how I run my business and how I've been successful. Um, so, yeah, it's been pretty, it's been pretty, it's been pretty good. Oh, go you. <laughs> Go Shopify for recognizing (laughs) Black women entrepreneurs. So that brings me to actually the actual physical, the actual, you know, tactical things you need to do to sell your product. You chose Big Cartel at first. Why did you choose that platform and what made you transition to Shopify? Um, Well, Big Cartel at the time, and this was back in, you know, 2011, I guess, um, I just needed something quick to, you know, post up stuff on and be able to, you know, put prices behind it and then people be able to pay for it. Um, but then after a while, um, I started to see that inventory was a problem. So, um, at the time, um, Big Cartel didn't have, uh, you know, a sophisticated inventory system and reporting. So I didn't know what was really selling. Like I had, you know, ideas, but I needed some hard numbers to see what was selling and how I'm making my money and what I should be bringing in. So then, um, I moved over to Shopify and, you know, Shopify had, was a, uh, was a much more robust, um, platform in order to, to grow my business. And, um, especially being now on the Shopify plus platform, I have a, um, I have a dedicated, um, I have a dedicated success manager who, uh, you know, who helps me, uh, you know, she'll say, okay, well, you know, uh, here's some SEO tips. Here's some, um, here's some, you know, here's how we can work on your conversion rates. Um, they've been very, very instrumental to, uh, the growth, uh, um, of Kinky Curly Yaki itself, um, in terms of a, a as an e-commerce business. Okay. And what's the, what's the full ecosystem from, you know, vendor to customer? Is it your shipping um, from like China and who's handling the inventory? And then how does that get to the final customer? Uh, well, right now, how we have it set up is we um, we import. So we import all of our product here. Um, we do like a monthly inventory uh, purchase. So it's, you know, kilos and kilos and kilos upon air based off of inventory reports uh, that are generated that are forecasting what we, what they're predicting we're going to sell. Um, but, you know, it's kind of funny because we've been using this uh, inventory prediction system for you know well over a year and it's it's still off because if one if, if one influencer posts a video on a kinky curly wig that's what sells mm. and you know if predicted we would sell more afro coily so that we have more afro coily on it and you know so it fluctuates but you know it's something that we sort of roll with um luckily um my manufacturer is pretty on the ball so you know if i'm up writing emails at four o'clock in the morning you know two days later i'll have um you know depending on what it is i'll have uh, some inventory uh, for that. But um, from there, 
Um, you know, when I started the business, I started selling the hair extensions out of those, you know, those Rubbermaid dressers, like, you know, those plastic bins. Yes. You know, it's just a five tier shelf. That was the inventory system. Fortunately, through the business, I've been able to purchase a house. I, you know, I was able to purchase it on my own. Um, and I renovated my basement um, to, so to basically hold all the inventory and for office space. Um, so all, currently, that's how we have it set up. Um, but Right now we're working, we have so much volume right now uh, and we're running out of space. So we're working on, um, we're working with a, a fulfillment center where we'll ship everything to the fulfillment center and then they would then send everything out on our behalf. However, it's such a, you know, I'm, I'm very hesitant to do that because this is such a, hair is such a personal business. Um, you know, I get, we get emails that come in that say, uh, you know, if you can, can I please get a 1B type of hair or, or um, you know, I want, um, can you send me, uh, you know, a, uh, a curlier, te- you know, a curlier Afro coily or, you know, that if you can. So, you know, we're thinking, you know, I'm sort of hemming and, and hawing on this, um, sending it all to a fulfillment center because then we just don't have that person. We can't have that personal touch. And I think that's what's really uh, been the, the, the driver behind my business is that personal touch. And so then um, the other option is to move into a warehouse space um, where we can still have that hands-on. We can still change orders at the last minute, like, oh, it's her birthday, so we should throw in some chapstick or a makeup bag or whatever the case may be. So um, that's that's the more, um, that's the more I guess, um, viable option right now. So right now we're looking for some office space because we're just, we're, our growth is just, it's been bananas. So wow, um, good <laughs> problems, I guess, right? Um, yeah, so, so I have a lot of good problems. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's amazing growth. And speaking of that, I, I think I heard you say in another interview that you know not everyone is going to be or needs to be a millionaire. Um, and I may be misquoting you a little bit, but tell me a little bit more about that statement. Like when you started this, what? you know, where are you now along that spectrum and and what is your ultimate goal with the business? Because if you, if you really want to just continue to scale and scale and scale, it's going to be really hard to keep it at that personal in the house or office space level as far as inventory. Um, so when I say that not everyone needs to be a millionaire, everyone thinks that, you know, they should start a business and automatically they're going to, you know, make billions and kajillions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in terms of Kinky Curly Yaki, um, for this, I would say for 2017, we are predicting, um, we are forecasting that we will enter these seven figures um, in terms in, in terms of sales. Um, so, but the thing is, is, it's not, it wasn't necessarily my goal to make a million dollars. It was just more... Um, I have a product that I really like, and I think you'll like it too. If I happen to make a million dollars, great. If I don't, you know what? I would still do it because I like, I I believe in what I sell. Um, So when I say that not everyone needs to be a millionaire, you know, you can make 700,000 and still be happy. That's still good. That's still something that's better than the nothing you started out with. Right. So um, it's great to have goals, but I also like to set realistic expectations for for myself. Um, So if I make 700,000, great. If I make a million, even better. But um, I didn't set out to be a millionaire. I set out to solve my own issue. And then I happen to be solving, you know, thousands of other black women's issues. So, um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about sustaining a profitable business. So how do you find dedicated and hardworking team members? How do you structure your business to, to manage this growth? Um, well, uh, you know, customer service is the backbone to business, to my business. So I, um, you know, when I first started actually with my family. So I'd hire my family to, to help me out. But now, um, you know, I, I looked, you know, I, I, I actually just recently hired someone that I, I found at a beauty supply store and I hired her because I went in there looking for something and she was super helpful from the minute I walked in the door. Um, and so that to me was, that's, you know, that's, that's someone I want on my team. That's someone that, um, that, that likes helping people. And, you know, that resonates in everything they do. Um, so when I, when I, uh, when I hire, um, you know, I've got uh, three girls that, that work, uh, on the customer service side, um, and then, uh, two people that work on the, uh, on the operation side, um, you know, I let them know that customers, the customers first, um, and to, or to, you know, try your best to courteous, you know, not everybody is happy. Um, but, um, you know, we try our, we, we ask that, to, I ask that they try their best to be courteous in, um, 
in, um, you know, in helping our customers. So um, everything that I've done, I've always looked at um, a person's disposition and um, you know the, the fact that they have manners. Yeah, <laughs> if they have manners, <laughs> so important. <laughs> so important. Do some brats up seat, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so important. <laughs> that will that will play very well with me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and what what can people do if you can't afford to pay a team and you're just starting out? Do you have any tips there? Oh, when I when I started, I did everything myself, and you know, even to this day, I still do a lot of stuff by myself. I still jump behind. Uh, I still jump in the emails and email and, you know, okay. reply to emails. Um, you just, you have to be, in order to be successful in your business, you have to be able to do everything. And the things that you cannot do, you have to outsource it. Like I am horrible at math. So I have an accountant, I have a bookkeeping team, you know, um, and you just have to be able to, um, to, to delegate. Uh, and, you know, being a business owner, it's hard to do. But in order to scale and to grow, that that is something absolutely that you have to do. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you're not able, if you're like you know, not able to, to to handle it at its worst, then you're not going to be able to handle your better your business at the best. So it's best that you get to know your business inside out and understand things. You may not understand the, the numbers, but um, or you may not be good with the numbers, but you need to be able to understand them and know that okay, I, I'm not good at this hand it off to someone else. Same right. thing with, um, you know, even if it gets down to shipping, if you have to ship stuff at four o'clock in the morning, then that's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And you got to yeah. be able to call someone on their bullshit. Like, okay, I may not be an accountant, but I know that something sounds wrong here. <laughs> exactly. Speaking of that, what, what was the biggest challenge or most surprising part of starting Kinky Curly Yaki? Uh, the haters. Mm. <laughs> the haters. I was really surprised at the haters. Um, you know, uh, it's when I first started, um, like I said, I didn't let anyone know who I was just because I didn't think it was necessary. But then, you know, there were some women who made it their business to try and find out who, who I was. And I just thought like, why, like, why would you do like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go to the beauty supply store and demand to know who runs who trade or, or, you know, the Janet collection or anything like that. Um, but you know, they were demanding to know who I was. So, um, you know, I was just sort of revealed by, by, by haters wow. and, you know, it was unfortunate, you know, like Kate isn't my real last name. Mm -hmm. um, it's my internet name. Yeah. Because, you know, running an internet business, people want to know your business. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. uh, um, you know, so I just, and, and as I had a son, you know, I just had a son, a lot of the stuff was happening when I just had him. Um, and so then, you know, I just sort of went into full, you know, mother lion mode and, and, you know, just had to protect myself. And that was, that was the most surprising thing about this business, but, you know, it's not so bad anymore. Um, but, but, but yeah, that was the most surprising thing about it. Oh, very interesting. Um, before, sure. before we get into the lightning round, I do want to touch a bit on the fact that you are a mom, a single mom. And, you know, I don't like to harp on that because I think as women, we always get that question. How do you juggle? And men never get that question. Um, but it, it is a, a, an aspect of something that you have to work around to, you know, be as effective as you can in your business. So how do you manage running your business and the demands like travel when you have a son? Um, well, you know, I like to, uh, I, my family has been a huge help and, you know, I don't even like to harp on the fact that I'm a single mother because I don't plan on staying single forever. So there's no point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right. Like I'm not going to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my son has been a great, you know, I make it a point, you know, people are like, well, you know, sometimes I'll see emails that say, you know, I wrote it in on Friday night and I didn't get a reply till Monday. And I say, you know, I like to give my, my, my team time. Like, you know, they have families, they have children, especially now that it's summertime, the kids are home. Um, you know, so I like to make family first. Yes, we do business, but you know what? I like to give my girls the time to, you know, be with their, to spend with their children. Cause we don't get the, this, we can't get this time back and time is such an expensive thing. And so then to spend it answering an email because you made a mistake on something that could easily be corrected on Monday. Uh, you know, I, 
I I don't want to minimize that, but I want I I, I need people to know that my family is very important to me, and without them, this this all wouldn't exist. So if I need to just spend time um, with my my family, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, you know, with my son, he's you know he's going through his terrible twos, so I, he won't let me live. <laughs> 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 you know, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to schedule this interview for the evenings, and I was like, oh no, 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 right, right. Happen. My son will let me. Go. He will not let me. Go. I right. thought it was. So funny when you said that, and I completely understood because I have nieces and nephews, and I and I can can imagine one of them being home when I'm trying to do something in the evening. <laughs> yeah, if you're your mom, meow, every all of a sudden they need everything. So, uh, but yeah, but in terms of traveling and everything, um, I um, again I rely. I, I gave up the the big city sexy life and moved to a smaller, you know, just outside of Toronto type life, so I could be closer to my family. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, they've been instrumental in helping me. And, you know, they, um, they, they watch my son while I travel. And sometimes I take him with me. Like when I went to the Shopify, um, when I went to the Shopify office, the, what I said to them was I said, listen, I'm traveling to Cleveland next weekend. I don't want to leave my son two weekends in a row. Um, if you want me there, then I'll, bring it, then I'll have to bring my son. They were like, well, here, here's, you know, we, they bought him a plane ticket. We bought him a plane ticket too. So, Oh, and then when I brought him into the offices, they entertained him. Uh-huh. So, you know, I only like to work with, yeah, like, like I, you know, I try to limit my travel to once a month um, so that I'm not out of town every single weekend. But, um, but yeah, my family has been has been instrumental. Awesome. Thank God for family. All righty. Now we're going to get in. Yes. Thank God. <laughs> Now we're going to get into the lightning round and you know the drill. You're going to answer the first thing that comes to mind and we're going to do it pretty quickly. Are you ready? Okay. All right. right. Number one, what's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Oh, my family, my family, family and friends. They are like your your number one supporters, number one, uh, you know, haters, number one, everything. But at the end of the day, um, you know, you need their support in order to to thrive in business. All right. Number two, what are some pitfalls that you can help other entrepreneurs avoid? Be a believer in your product. Don't just sell something because everyone else is selling it. Um, Solve a problem. So if, um, you know, just because so-and-so is making billions of dollars off waste trainers doesn't mean you should sell it too. Find um, a particular niche that hasn't been, um, that hasn't been delved into and focus on that. And if it's something that you're passionate about, even better. Uh, so that's what I, so in order to avoid any sort of huge business failures, invest in something that you would actually use. And that would, that would, that's going to help your business succeed. All right. Number three, what's the best book or podcast episode or live event that you've consumed this year? Um, right now I'm into Gary. Vaynerchuk. <laughs> yes, Vaynerchuk. Yes, yes. Yeah, shout out to Gary V. Um, and your podcast, your podcast is fabulous. Oh, thank um, you. I was listening over the last couple of weeks. I've been listening to the podcast. So, um, so yeah, those are the those are the things that I've been consuming this this past year. Awesome, appreciate that. Um, number four, what is a daily practice? you use to start your day on the right note and increase productivity throughout your day? Um, I like to, uh, I like to rely, like I, the first thing I do, like when I go to drop off my son at daycare, uh, which I, I call school, I tell him it's school, we're going to school. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell, I ask God to order my thoughts, my words and my action. So that means I'm asking him to order all my steps for that day. Um, so that anything that comes out of my mouth doesn't bankrupt me or anything, um, <laughs> you know, anything that I, I do isn't the wrong thing or anything that I think isn't as, a, you know, isn't filling my head with negativity. So, you know, asking him to order my thoughts and my words and my actions and, you know, exercise, you know, a couple of months ago, back in June, I ran my first try a triathlon. So, um, getting in some exercise, you know, to help clear your mind and help get you into physical and mental, uh, shape that's that that increases my product my productivity tenfold number five what's your parting advice for fellow woman entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss but are worried about losing that steady paycheck uh you know money comes and money goes if you're a single uh, woman and you know you have a great resume 
attached, I would just go for it. Um, so I would say, you know, you don't need just like, you know, earlier when we mentioned, talked about millionaires, you don't need to be a millionaire. You got to just, you got to start somewhere. So you got to start somewhere, start somewhere. That's really, that's really what I've got. That's my, that's my best. Start somewhere. You don't have to go big or go home. No, you just start with something. And then you grow from there. Everyone thinks, you know, we're in that age of, you know, immediately like everything comes, you know, right now, now, right now, right now, everything doesn't come that way. So patience and be willing, be open-minded to take, uh, you know, risks. Amen. I love that. That is a perfect note to end on. Start somewhere because you're right. And everyone, you feel this pressure to be successful right away when you start something these days. I don't know if it's social media or what. And that's why I emphasize the, you know, origin stories on this podcast, really getting people to walk me through the process because I want to show that it's not overnight and it's often way more years than you think from looking at even, you know, a blog post that someone wrote. So thank you so much for sharing that because it's, it's, it can't be stated enough, like start somewhere, grow, get better, let time do its thing. <laughs> that patient, patient. Yes. <laughs> And on that note, what's next for Kinky Curly Yaki? Wow. Um, we are, we're actually just, work, we're starting to do collaboration. So we're working with, um, we're going to be working with uh, a big brand uh, that you would find in Sally Beauty Supply Stores. Um, and we're going to be working with them, um, you know, doing videos. And, and and other um, events in 2017. So it's we're just we're just getting started. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. And for anyone who wanted to know more about the actual process of you know starting an e-commerce business and with inventory, what's the best way that they can connect with you after this episode? Uh, they can send me an email. So Vivian at kinkycurlyaki.com. Uh, let me know that you heard me on the podcast. So that way I don't think you're just some creepy person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So free to email me and I'd be more than happy to, you know, to jump on a, a phone call, um, you know, a quick 50 minute phone call or, you know, reply to some email, ask right. some questions by email. That's not a problem. Cool. Thanks so much for your willingness to do that with our audience. And with that, I just want to thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair today, Vivian. This was great. Oh, you are more than welcome. Thank you for having me. This was, it was, it was great. I really appreciate it. It was fun. All right. And there you have it. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at side hustle pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the Side Hustle Pro Facebook community. Go to sidehustlepro.co forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week. Thank you.